This is AIGA. We believe design inspires the world, especially when we inspire each other. As designers, we are more versatile than ever before, and our work has unprecedented power to influence everything around us. When we work together, we learn from each other, we support each other, and we inspire each other. Together, we are stronger than we could ever be on our own. And only together can we ensure that everyone, not just designers, but everyone in business, government, the media, and the public, understands the potential of design to change everything. We are AIGA, the Professional Association for Design. speaker event of 2016. Happy New Year. Um, my name is Jess Moore, current president of AIGA Colorado. Dan Mikowski's opening line from his LinkedIn profile is, we are surrounded by careless design, closed corporate cultures, and mediocre ambitions. I joined AIGA in 2006, two months into a position working as the sole in-house designer for a financial consulting firm. That statement clearly resonates with me. It was a great job. Uh, it led me to my why. Why for joining AIGA? To have an outlet to be with my people. I'd like, to think, I'd like you to think about your why. Why are you a member? Or why aren't you a member? The Colorado AIGA chapter is a strong group statewide. And maybe your reason is to have access to inspiring events like tonight's. Or perhaps you're a student getting ready to graduate and looking to have your portfolio reviewed. Perhaps you're new to Colorado and looking to get to know local creatives and meet peers. We hold events like these um, for all of your why reasons. It takes a hardworking board to put those together and I'd like to offer you the opportunity to join our board. Nominations will be opening up in a few days. And since we're speaking about our board, I'd like to take a moment to thank all of our board members. Um, each one works hard to put on events like this, to communicate those events, to provide information, inspiration, and mentorship. If you are on the board or if you have served on the board, I'd like you to stand up and I want to give you a big thank you. Yes. things done around here and that's why yeah. yes thank you before I turn it over I just want to take a moment to let you know of a few upcoming events <laughs> this is AIGA <laughs> um, so Tuesday is drink and draw and we're gonna have those in four cities across the state you can check the site for your specific location um, Sunday <laughs> Sunday, March 19th, is a calligraphy event in Colorado Springs. And then Tuesday, the 22nd, we're doing books, bites, and beers in B -B Boulder. <laughs> um, so join this intimate group to discuss books that inspire you. Both of the events are limited, so sign up pronto. Um, our next speaker event will be here on March 31st with Nikki Villa Gomez. She'll be speaking about how culture affects typography. You can help shape the event, um, the event's contents, con you can help shape the event's content, there we go, by sending in photos of your favorite Colorado typography. Nikki will use the photos you send in to create her presentation. Uh, so consider yourself challenged. Um, really look at typography, hmm? Yeah, I, I'm getting there. <laughs> um, so really look at typography that makes up our visual landscape. Um, types of pictures can include graffiti, manhole covers, um, hand lettering, local signs, and submit by March 4th. Check the website um, for all your hashtags, tweeters, Instagrams, what have you. 
Um, and I'd like to thank Denver Art from Museum for hosting us and the Design Council. Um, enjoy your evening. And I'd like to introduce Jenny Ta Taylor, our speaker series chair. Hi, everybody. Um, I know I totally jumped the gun because it would be so cool if everyone could take, like, go out tonight, take some pictures, some typography, hashtag, all those fun things. Um, yeah, I think it's hashtag uh, AIGA Colorado, hashtag Colorado type, um, and of course, Nikki's, which would be really cool. Um, I've sent her a lot of stuff, so we'll have some good content, but it'd be really cool to hear from you guys. So yeah, so thanks for coming to um, the first event of 2016. Um, not only has Dan designed for companies such as Google, Capital One, Dell, and Microsoft, he has also built and led discussions and given talks about um, fostering inspiration, collaboration, and building an innovative culture around design. Not only are we excited to have Dan here in Denver tonight with us, um, we are thankful that he didn't pursue his first creative passion as part of the international hip-hop group, which is a true story, <laughs> right? Um, Instead, he started designing four experiences, thus making our world a little more intuitive. Um, but let's be honest, we're here because we got free Play-Doh. Hopefully, Ooh. everyone got some free Play-Doh. Um, it is a pretty awesome um, that we get to play with this um, awesome tool. Um, Dan calls it more of a simple tool for making and innovating. I think it's really great because it gets us off of our computer, it gets us out of his head, we can actually just do something really playful and get into a really creative and innovative space. So without further ado, don't get the plate out yet, just wait for it. Um, I would like to introduce Dan to the stage and to Denver. <laughs> Right, I am really excited to be here. Um, and I think this kind of captures it all. Um, you know, there's kind of an energy here. And I was introducing myself to a few folks and like, what are you doing here tonight? I haven't seen you at AIGA. And then I like turned my head this way. And they're like, oh, you're the speaker tonight. Um, some of you may not know this, but I actually spent a bunch of years at a really pivotal moment in my life and my career here. And this is one of the images that I was able to, to find back in the day. And some of you will notice that this is awesome for a couple of reasons. Number one, anyone know that logo on my t-shirt? Oh, Sapien. Raise your hand if you worked at Sapien. Yes. So part of the Sapien family. The other reason is there's a lot more up on top um, <laughs> back in those days. And tonight I'm going to tell you a little bit about kind of my journey and my story because I haven't really been back in 15 years. And so selfishly, you know, this is more of an opportunity for me just to kind of share humbly some things that I've done and give you some ideas on kind of what might lead to building a culture of innovation. Um, and so that, the topic tonight um, is one that I think you know, it's really broad and really vast and really deep. And I've tried to summarize three key points. And so let me just tell you what those are. You know, I think these to me are the ingredients of, of innovating well. You know, the first one is fearlessness. And we'll talk a little bit about that. One of the first activities we'll do is drawing. So if you don't already have a piece of paper and something to write with, get that ready because we're going to address some of our fear. You know, the second one is um, human fueled. You know, we, a lot, we hear the term human centered design a lot. And I think there's something beyond the current practices of focusing on people and actually having people be fueling the entire process from within. So most of my talk is going to be about that. It is the most controversial, the least understood, and the least kind of embraced by the design community. And the last one I think is fast. And a lot of you guys, especially on the agency side, or on the client side, know that this is really important. Um, and I'll talk about how I learned from the leader of DARPA, how that's even more critically important. Okay, so some of you may know that um, I left Google to go to a bank. You may be questioning my judgment, <laughs> as many of my colleagues did at the time. And, you know, I'm continually reviled on social media for making this choice. So this is like a tweet a little while ago. You know, why go to a bank? That's not going to bring positive change. You know, it's interesting. The actual mission of Capital One is to change banking for good. And Capital One really means it. And so I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, because I think there's some really interesting lessons 
you know, in some ways it's easy to innovate at a culture like Google, but I think it's probably more interesting to talk about maybe for drinks at the end or after this about how it's how you can really do that in a place that's not used to that kind of culture. And I've been at Capital One for 18 months. The first nine months, I was kind of building the team and getting started and kind of understanding what we were going to do. And then the second nine months, we've been creating and building. And so I may offend some with this metaphor, but I feel like we're in the third trimester <laughs> of our process. <laughs> and it's a little bit of an awkward phase. Um, <laughs> does anyone know this guy, the, the story about this guy? So this, this went viral on Reddit a few months ago. This, this, uh, this couple had a maternity photographer coming to the house. And at the last minute, the wife, she just kind of freaked out. She's like, I don't want to take naked pictures. And he's like, well, I'm going to take maternity photos for the <laughs> two of us. So he's got a wonderful series on behalf of the family <laughs> um, to embrace this moment. So, so basically tonight I have two things to share with you. I will share you a little bit of that kind of... Um, the team and kind of what we think about innovation in a bank at the end. Um, but the first thing is, let me just tell you my story. Let me use that as a way to try to introduce these three principles of building an innovation culture. Um, and we'll start with thing one. So given that we're talking about children, this is the beginning of my life. This is my first day in the planet. And whenever I have a hard day, I just look at my mom's face and remember that I was loved and cherished. <laughs> and then I look at this picture of my mom. <laughs> because my mom's an actress. This is her as Renfield in Dracula. And this is my dad. He's a graphic designer. And I grew up with these two artistic parents, which kind of sucked because we had no money growing up. <laughs> and we had to like make our own toys out of like cardboard and stuff. Like here's a testament to that kind of <laughs> stage of life. And you can see my emerging fashion sense, roller skates and plaid pants. But it was also awesome because my parents allowed my sister and I to fully express and create. And there was a room that they created that was uh, long before whiteboards were a thing you could just buy. They actually went to a hardware store and bought shower boards and put them up in the room. And my, my sister and I could just throw paint around and draw and just, we had all this freedom. And you might think, that this is why I'm creative or I went into a creative discipline. But I actually don't think that's the case. And we're going to do a quick activity. It's going to take 60 seconds to demonstrate that we are all fundamentally creative. Now, this is not a group I have to convince of that. You, many of you come in this world, in this discipline with that skill set. But um, So get your um, paper and some drawing implement ready. And I'm going to give you a really simple task. All right, everyone have something? Okay. I'm going to ask you to turn to one of your neighbors, left or right, front or back. Introduce yourself. Give them a high five, fist bump. Okay. Now, I want you to draw them. You have 60 seconds. Go. about halfway done. We've got about 30 seconds left. All right, we're in the final 10 seconds. Finish up those masterpieces. Three, two, one. Okay, so now share your drawing to the person who it's of.
Okay. Now, hold these up to me. I want to do an epic panoramic photo just to capture this moment of courage and creativity. All right. Now, you have to be still or else you're going to, like, get blurred out. So, one, two, three. Okay. Awesome. Now, what you guys just did, this happens every time you do this activity with adults. There's lots and lots of sorries. <laughs> right? Lots of embarrassed laughter. There's this kind of, even when I gave you guys the, the, the task, there's this like, oh, kind of like, you know, okay, what's going to happen here? Now, this is an activity that was actually done by a Stanford professor, by, the, by this guy by the name of Bob McKim here on the left. He was actually in the Stanford engineering department. And he recognized that there was something special about the role of design and creativity in the classic engineering process, which typically is very rational, logical, problem-solving process. And by the way, he is actually the mentor of the founders of IDEO. And actually, the D school was really kind of, he was the first person at Stanford to start asking questions that led to what kind of the conversation around design thinking. Now, when he did this with kids, something totally different happens. What do you think happens when you do this with kids, especially below the age of middle school? They just draw. They just draw. There's no particular fear. There's no particular excitement. It's just natural, right? And anyone who's worked with or has kids of their own, and you just put paper and crayons down, they'll start drawing. They'll start making. So Bob used this activity to prove two things. One is we are innately creative and expressive as human beings. It's one of the things that differentiates us as a species. And number two, that as we grow older, for some reason, we start to fear the judgment of our peers. And that fear starts to close down our creative juices. And so that's number one, is to remember um, that we need to kind of work on that muscle. And there's a great book. How many of you have seen this book, Creative Confidence, from the Kelly Brothers? It's a fantastic book. The founders of IDEO wrote this book after one of the brothers you know, was on his deathbed. Um, might not make it through cancer. And they've written lots of books. And they said, if we make it through, this is the book we have to write. And so this is an amazing book to inspire the first element of an innovation culture of fearlessness. Okay. Continuing with my story. So fast forward 10 years. This is the stage of life when I was aspiring to be a hip-hop dancer. I went to an international high school in Canada. Uh, any, any guesses which one of those is me? That handsome one in the middle, yeah. That was me. And, uh, and actually, that is my wife. So that's the other great thing about creating an innovation culture. Um, you know, have something more important to you than design or outside of work. Um, okay, so at that stage of life, I started expressing my creativity more through, through dance. And, and because I went to an international high school, I wasn't ready to go to university. I needed to explore the world, so I spent two years in Africa and in the Middle East and in Europe doing social and economic development using the performing arts. And so when I went to school, I decided that I was going to be a diplomat and I was going to go into development work. I went to Tufts University in Boston. The one thing I said I would never ever do is design because my dad's a designer. And even though I don't have deep daddy issues, I don't think, <laughs> you, when you're 19, you just want to do your own thing. But then my dad gave me this book called Information Architects by this guy, Richard Saul Werman. Anyone know Richard Saul Werman? Awesome. Usually no one knows, but I figured AIGA, you guys will know. So, you know, he coined the term information architecture. He started the TED conferences. Um, and he's really been an influential leader in, th in thinking about how you take massive, complex data and systems and as a designer, try to make it simple and clear. And I loved this book. And I, most importantly, I loved a particular chapter about this guy, Clement Mock, who was you know, uh, an Apple creative director. And after he left Apple, he created one of the first digital kind of first design agencies. Back in the day when 
designers were like lamenting the lack of control in this new medium, you know, Clement and his team at Studio Archetype were embracing it, right? So, um, and he said this really important thing to me, which was that the experience is the brand. And as a young designer who was feeling like the craft was more important than the artifacts, this was an important message to me. And I think many of you guys know this, right? You've, you've seen this. Clement was president of AIGA for several years. And, uh, you know, we, we've, this is part of the heritage. And this was the site back in the day. Like, this was like awesome web design. <laughs> Circa 98, maybe. Amazing, right? And so basically, the first six years of my career, from working with Clement in New York until leaving Colorado, I was a consultant. And I kind of lived this kind of life. I was, you know, kind of, like, you know, a little bit more progressive in our attitudes towards women and other things, but um, really fast paced and working for lots of clients. And, you know, and especially working, um, so Studio Archetype was uh, bought by this larger company called Sapiens, where that logo came from. And during that time, we were working with the AIG and defining what experience design was. And this was Rick Raffae's attempt. He said, if graphic design dealt with the form of things, then communication design evolved to have form and content. And now with digital tools, we actually have form, content, and context over time, right? These digital tools can change. And this was like experience design. So who, how many people here have some title that's related to UX? Right, so this is kind of the first definition of all of that in the AIGA world. And then Sapien bought this other little company called eLab and these are experts in research. And we were working on this project for United. And I was actually on a side project, but I, I was kind of new to the whole world and kind of observing what was happening. And these researchers brought in about a dozen people and asked, they brought them this, you know, this printout of a blank browser page and said, hey, if you came to United's homepage, what kind of stuff would you want, just for you? If, if United knew your mind and hearts and needs, and they would sketch out some ideas. And then they would, l they would show them in post-its and in markers, these really rudimentary prototypes. And I had never seen this before. And honestly, it pissed me off. Because I was making, I don't know, what were we making, 300 an hour, right? At studio at the time. And ordinary people are coming in and they're doing like my job. <laughs> I was like, people don't know what they want. They're, you know, they're not designers. And then I saw that over the next 18 months, as this very complex website evolved, the insights from those 12 people, those four days, helped to solve the most complicated interaction and information design problems that I had ever seen. And I took humbly those researchers out to lunch and I said, hey guys, I was totally wrong. Where does that come from? Like, how, is there more of that kind of superpower? And they, intro they introduced me to this woman, Liz Sanders on the right here. Um, no one knows her. Very few people. Who, who, who knows Liz Sanders in this room? Three or four. Yeah, she's really obscure um, in the larger community, but she is my hero because she's the one that came up with the framework useful, usable, desirable. That's her framework. As well as she wrote this paper where she said this. And like that was the week I'd put on my business cards, like Dan McCoskey, experienced designer, <laughs> sapient. And I was like, you know, I read her paper and I was pissed again. I was like, what are you talking about? And then I read her definition of experience, which is this. An experience is a moment felt by an individual at the intersection of our experiences and our, our memories from the past and our dreams for the future. And actually it's, it's kind of an internal event. We even have a hard time understanding our own moments sometimes. Like we have to, you know, tweet or blog or something. You know, Facebook has this feature now that's like reminding me like seven years ago, you did this thing. Do you want to talk about it? Like I really don't care about that anymore. But that one I do, right? Like so sometimes we only look back years later and we can understand our, mo our own moments. So what Liz said was, if that's how special and inaccessible an experience is, Designers cannot be so presumptuous to believe that we can create that for you. 
But she did say if you put the word for in there, it makes it better. So you can design for experience. And all of a sudden, okay, I can still be an experience for designer or a designer of experiences. I don't know. Like, you know. Um, but it was a really important change in my mental model. And then Liz said, look, you know, actually, most research methods, they kind of look at the past and the moment itself. So ethnographic research is exploring, you know, what you're doing right at that moment, right? You see that world. And a lot of observational, a, a lot of um, interview focus group, survey kind of research, uh, it doesn't really get that far into the really interesting stuff out here, dreams of the future. And so she said that if you want to understand that part, you have to get people to do something uh, which she calls making. So you can listen to what people say, you can observe what they do, or you can see what they make. And the reason why you all have Play-Doh in your hands tonight is because we're actually going to make together. I'm going to show you the power of making to get insights in really kind of rapid time frames. Okay, and Liz would do these kind of things. So she would say, if you have, if you want to engage people in making, you have to give them new tools. They can't use Photoshop or Illustrator or your web dev frameworks or whatever the professional tools that developers and designers use in our craft. But they can use markers and paper and Play-Doh and use that as a medium to express their hopes and dreams for the future, which is really powerful. And so this is a project for Microsoft where they're in this family's dining room and it's a father and a son and they're actually designing a game controller for a PC. And they made this custom toolkit. So this is called ambiguous stimuli. So these are shapes that don't quite look like a controller. They could really be anything that you wanted them to be. And they're covered in Velcro that you can then attach these little knobs and gems and beads to and just tell stories. And when I saw this, I just said, this, this is pretty amazing. And this is how, li we, won't go, we don't have time to go in, in great depth, but essentially, we as designers or champions of design, we want to go really deep into people's lives. And that's, that deep stuff is what's called latent knowledge, right? The explicit stuff is stuff that people will tell you. Like, oh, I hated it when, you know, I was at the airport and I couldn't find Jenny because the signage was horrible. Like, that's explicit knowledge, right? Then there's stuff you can observe through ethnographic research. And then there's this really mysterious but awesome area of tacit and latent knowledge. If you want to get that stuff, you have to get people to create things that express their dreams, what they feel. So that's the second part ingredient to an innovation culture is and what I call human-fueled, what Liz would call participatory design or co-creation. And I'm going to share with you two or three little projects that I've done that have had that element at the core of the design process. Okay, so going back to my story. So I'm here in Denver. I was working for this guy. And this was my boss. Where's you? Over here. He used to work for a company called IXL back in the days. This is when there were the, you know, the Iant days, Scient, Viant, Sapient. And then uh, he brought in this other guy that I used to work with. <laughs> And, and then this happens. Um, we experienced, you know, the most horrific um, kind of bursting of the tech bubble back in the, back in the, in the dot-com days. And we stuck in to the bloody end. There were four rounds of layoffs. They ended up closing the Denver office. Um, and then we were like, all right, let's do something else. And um, Fred continued his teaching. He did, I don't know, his advising and consulting, whatever he does. <laughs> and I ended up working for this awesome company called Texture Media and um, as their creative director. And this was a company that was doing some pretty awesome work. They didn't quite, quite know they were doing co-creation, but that's ex essentially what it was. They were working for like Marmot, for example, where one of our staff members was actually a sponsored athlete with Marmot and would go on these expeditions with prototype gear and the team was like, we should capture that. That's probably an interesting story to tell. And actually started this kind of authentic storytelling around the people who are making and creating and using all this gear. And so I think that this is your work, right, David? Maybe? Maybe? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Maybe it's before your time. Anyway, we got some texture medians in the house. Um, this work was so interesting that we started talking about it. And I was at a conference. Now, this is interesting. This is the Designing for User Experiences Conference. So this is actually Liz Sanders' influence here. 
in the industry, right? This isn't the experience design conference. The designing for, you, it's a little awkward, Liz, but anyway. Um, at this conference, someone from this company came up to me afterwards and was like, hey, we should talk. And, and I looked at, the per at this person who was a design manager. I said, do you have designers at Microsoft? <laughs> and I, you know, I wasn't trying to be a jerk. I mean, because I, I said, when I use your products, it's not clear to me <laughs> that there is any one part of the process <laughs> that thinks about people and design. But I went out and I, and I saw that Microsoft knew that. And they actually cared a whole lot about improving that. And actually some of our colleagues that were out here ended up going there too, Arnie Lund and some others. And I ended up going to, I had, I, I had to choose between Microsoft, like Windows Server or MSN. And of course I chose MSN because I had no idea what was happening in the server world. And I started working on all this stuff. This was some like early, early work during the Vista days, uh, when we were thinking about the integration of software and the internet, long before cloud computing and this thing called Live, and we created something called Spaces. And so like that was my first experience at Microsoft. Um, and then I worked for a couple years on the Emerging Markets team. And long before the iPad Pro had come out, we had imagined this device that could be a tablet and a laptop and an education low-cost computer that Microsoft was just never ready to really ship because they were so software focused, but it got me interested in hardware. And so I worked with the Microsoft team that was designing computers that were supposed to harmoni you know, be harmonious with you know, the, the software design language because Apple would kick Microsoft's butt all the time in integrated hardware and software. And so we worked with Dell and Toshiba on, these, on the hardware that would align to the Vista design language. And this was the one that I was the interaction designer on, which honestly I didn't do that much because I didn't even know what hardware interaction design was. I think the one thing I did is, you know, we were talking about where to put all the USB ports and audio jacks. And, you know, we, we actually put them in a recess area around this, this front plate. And even just that one simple change, all of a sudden this didn't communicate, I'm a PC. It was a, I'm a device in the home that could help you in some interesting ways. And you had these sleeves that you could change, right? And one of them was bamboo. And I kind of fell in love with bamboo at that point as well. And so it just, it created a new language of computing. And so when an opportunity at Microsoft came to work on this, I was really excited because Microsoft was controlling the hardware. So this was the first Microsoft Surface. Before it was a, like a svelte little tiny tablet that we'd you know, do all this like ninja acrobatics. It was a big ass table. And we actually called it that. We actually, our shipping crates had like the Batman single, symbol for BAT, big ass table. <laughs> and it had five infrared cameras and you had to interact with it with your hands and objects. And so this was one of the first times at Microsoft I used co-creation. What we did was we were looking at a mapping application. Like how do you allow people in a hotel lobby to decide on dinner was our scenario. And you can see we created this, this, this toolkit. We went to like Staples and bought actual file folders and objects to start prototyping with. We had a live map, a layer of acrylic so people could draw, and you could see, like look at our metaphors, right? Like classic tabs, like we were in that, what we call the WIMP days, Windows Icons Menu Pointer, like deeply steeped in classic software design. And then we would have people go through scenarios and encourage them to create their own if it didn't work, and this is what one of the participants created. Just, just like, well, I can't, oh, this is cluttering the table. It's all on one side. If, I, if the other person wants to look at it, you have to like, I don't know how I'd flip that around. And so they just started creating a keychain, which had all the categories on the map. You could close it, you could fan it out, you could pull off an area. And we actually, this became really interesting. And we kept that in subsequent tests. And all the people that participated in the research felt like this was the best way to work with the scenario. And it became something that we got around IP around. We actually built into the entire software process. And so this was the first time for me that co-creation helped to solve actually a very tactical, tangible interaction problem. Because at first I had thought that it was just for like fuzzy, you know, inspiration. Not that it could actually solve deep problems. Okay, to get, let's get to the kind of second half of the story. You know, Microsoft has no VP of design today. 
it's a decentralized organization. I had felt like I had done as much as I could do there. So when Motorola called me and said, hey, Dan, we need an executive design leader to manage design research. What do you think? I got excited about it. And I said, but I'm not a researcher. And they said, well, why don't you try out that Play-Doh stuff that you do? I was like, all right. So Play-Doh can, you know, sometimes just, you know, put on your resume, expert <laughs> in Play-Doh. And uh, we actually, um, we're, we, we worked on something called the Moto X. Anyone ever own the Moto X here? <laughs> Woohoo! <laughs> okay. What did you love the most about your phone? Awesome. What was like, you remember any like feature that stood out to you that like you used a lot or you loved? Awesome. I should have talked to you before because we're not getting to the place where we want to go. Do you remember any, <laughs> any, <laughs> okay, outside of the industrial design, actually using it, like what could you do with your phone that no one else could do? Okay. Okay. So what was really interesting about this phone, it was the first time that Motorola showed restraint because we had been using Android and we had like 34 of our own customized apps. We had our own browser. We had our own email client. We had like, it was just insane the amount of customization that we were trying to do. And it ended up really confusing the heck out of people that are like, you know, staying in the Android world but trying to understand different apps. So what we said with this phone is we're taking pure Android stock Android from Google and only doing three things. And they turned to my team to say, hey, research, what should we do? And one of the things that was most loved about this phone, um, I'll talk about how it was created, but this is also, one of those three things was we knew we'd want to customize it. So you get to design this phone, lightweight design. You're really choosing from a number of materials and customizations and specs. Um, as part of the process, you would kind of make it yourself. And then what we did is we did this co-creation research. So if you see in the corner on this chair, all those little squares, those were squares that were covered with whiteboard material. They were small, as small as something you could put onto a watch or as large as something you could make into a flat screen TV. And we had people in their homes role play what the future would be like. And the family would like, get together and they would like think, they, first they would brainstorm and then they would kind of think about these things. We would leave. And then we would say, we're going to come back and not interview you. We're going to be a film crew. Lights, camera, action, go. And then they would like act out five years in the future. And one of the things that we consistently saw was people talking naturally to screens, which we kind of like, anyone have an echo in the room? Yeah? Like my kids had not only install, installed the fart app, but they know so many more jokes now. Um, because of the echo, but, or Siri or Google now, like speaking to devices is fairly common. Um, but we saw that trend before anyone had actually built it. And this is a, a woman that came home about an hour before her boyfriend, and she would just automatically turn on the TV so that there'd be the sound of like companionship. And she's like, I do this ritual every day. Why can't my TV just know that I'm home? Maybe you can talk to me. Hey, Jenny, what do you want to see tonight, right? And then we saw this in all kinds of places. And so we actually built this into the Moto X. We called it touchless control where you didn't actually have to press buttons. You could just say, hey, Google now, right? And this became actually one of the most loved features. Clearly not to the gentleman in the second row. <laughs> <laughs> Note to self, bring a $20 bill next time. Okay. Um, so anyway, so this was kind of um, a, an another example of how this kind of research can unveil a really interesting innovation area that kind of comes from people role-playing the future. And then Google, but Motorola, which is kind of depressing and exciting, right? One of the original tech innovators of the US, Motorola getting bought by this new tech innovator, and, but it was kind of about to die. And they didn't quite like us. They just wanted our patents. It was interesting. But one of the things they brought in was Dr. Regina Dugan, who had run this group called DARPA. Raise your hand if you know what DARPA is. A lot of you guys. OK, I had no idea what DARPA was. But it's basically the US military's advanced research group. And they have a really amazing track record of delivering extraordinary things. Like, how many of you guys have used GPS to get around in the last day or two? Right? DARPA, GPS. How many of you guys have used, like, the internet in the last, like, five seconds? <laughs> right? The ARPANET, DARPA, right? Well, you can't get the internet in here, so that's why you're forced to listen to me. I see some people leaving just like, I gotta get to Facebook. 
<laughs> no, come back. Um, but so DARPA has had this really amazing track record of innovation. And uh, the way that <laughs> Regina describes this is like, it's a band of pirates in Silicon Valley trying to do epic shit. And, you know, she's really, you know, the pirate language comes from the Steve Jobs story at Apple. If you don't know that story, you should look it up. It's pretty awesome. And I was like, I worked for her for two years. So actually, when I joined Capital One, we have another Capital One employee. The two of us, the one, you're the only Capital One employee in Colorado. Almost true. You're half of the population of the Capital One team in Colorado. Yeah. Um, th we have this thing called Pulse in Capital One where you can actually put your um, expertise. And I was just lazy. And so instead of putting like Creative Suite, I put for expertise, doing epic shit. <laughs> and then like a, the next week, my boss calls me up. He's like, hey, Dan, there's been some comments. I was like, what do you mean? He's like, well, people have been asking, is it really that appropriate? for one of our executives to be using such crass language. And I was like, oh, man, I don't know if I made the right choice. <laughs> um, but then I actually, um, we'll talk about it later, why I actually think that phrase and that word is appropriate. And for DARPA, it's appropriate because it's about preserving and protecting human life on the battlefield, right? There's a sense of urgency. And in a lot of spaces that we work with, there's also, you can tap into that sense of urgency. Now, Regina gives a TED Talk about failure. And she's, what she does is she asks this question of what would you do if you knew that you couldn't fail? And I saw the TED Talk before I ended up working with her. And I remember watching the TED Talk and being like, oh, man, I would love to answer that question. I would do all kinds of amazing things. I would do like those, you know, speeder bikes and Empire Strikes Back. And I would do like, I, mean, I would just do all this kind of stuff, right? I was just fantasizing. And then when she actually asked me that question, it was shockingly hard because you deal with all that fear. What am I going to do? And at DARPA, they kick you out after two years, no matter how good you are. And it forces you to take radical risks in a short period of time. And Regina at Google said, you can only work for me for two years. I'm going to kick you out. I was like, awesome. I can't wait to work for this woman. I don't know what, how, how that worked. But um, so the way that I answer this question is, you know, I, you know, we're all really impressed with what Johnny Ive has been able to create. And we, we love what he's done. But to me, what Apple has created and what's kind of what we see with beautiful industrial design, it's kind of the ultimate expression of the industrial revolution. Taking one object and repeatedly making that thing a million times. And I had been exposed to this other way of thinking and working and being which kind of comes from like the maker movement. This is at, uh, how, many, how many of you guys have been to like a maker fair before? You should go to one of these things. There's just, it's an incredible community of people that create. And so I just said, what if we did the exact opposite of what Johnny Ive would do and Apple would do? What if we created a phone that was kind of like Lego, where you could, you know, move and kind of switch things around? And so Regina said, well, how are you going to try that out? And I said, I have no idea because I don't know hardware, but, you know, I talked to some of my, my, my friends who had some like hacking and hardware skills and they, we took a Motorola phone and ripped the back off and put on this thing called a yo-yo board. It's basically an Arduino compatible microcontroller, which for those of you who are like, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> it's basically a little tiny computer that allows engineers to turn this phone into whatever they want. They can use the sensors and the camera and all the capabilities for whatever they want to create. And we did a test with this class at Berkeley it was a kind of me mechanical engineering class. And these guys, they just created awesome stuff. And actually, this team came up, and they, this was their device. They called it the Razor Laser. And, you know, they're like, they turn this thing on, and they're like, check it out. And I'm in the audience, and there's, like, silence. No blinking lights. Like, this is really embarrassing. Like, nothing's working. And then they would move it around, and progressively, you would see this, like, wave of astonishment because they were forming sound waves just to one little spot. And they would have fun prototyping this in class as they're playing like Beyonce in the back of the class and the, the teacher has no idea. And, and it was really awesome to see this example because this is something Motorola probably wouldn't have created on our own, but this proved to us that makers just do awesome stuff. And so we decided to create what we call a hardware development kit in software. How many of you guys do mobile apps for iOS or Android? Right, okay, so in those platforms, you just download the SDK, right? You can do it in the middle of the night, in your pajamas, you know, easily. 
to take a hardware development kit, it's built in atoms. You can't just download it, you have to move it. So we took a Sprinter van and wrapped it in 4,000 linear feet of Velcro, because Velcro is awesome, <laughs> and the ultimate symbol of hardware flexibility. You know, you can stick anything to it and change the design anytime. The problem here, though, is, and this is a story for another time, but I can show you an awesome video about this. We didn't prototype driving at night hundreds of miles. <laughs> and you can imagine when you have, like, millions of hooks on your vehicle at night attracting all these bugs, <laughs> you'd show up in the next town and you'd have to, like, power wash for, like, half an hour. So, anyway, so Velcro wasn't actually as awesome as we thought it was. But we ended up... Taking, so this, this, what's in this actually, it, the most important thing is it's a crew of makers. So there's developers and designers, there's architects, industrial, uh, industrial designers, and a filmmaker who would be coaches and tutors to help people make things using laser cutters, 3D printers, and then several hundred of these hackable phones. And we were like, if this Berkeley class can do cool, cool stuff, what would other people do? And we drove 14,002 miles across the country. This was our actual route. And, and by the way, the only reason I was able to go on this trip was because that kid in the skateboard is actually my son. Because when I told my wife, hey, I've got a business trip coming up, she's like, oh, cool, where are you going? It's like, well, we're going across the country for six months. She's like, are you insane? Because i got three kids, right? How, how, how could you do that? I said, well, what if we took Max? It could be father-son bonding <laughs> on the road. And she's like, oh, yeah, that'd be nice, right? So anyway, it w really was bonding, but I would, uh, you know, it was my ticket to, uh, to participate in this experience. And what we would do is we would go to um, places like makers, like this kid Kane. If you haven't seen Kane Arca Kane's arcade video from L.A., you got to check out this kid. He built his own cardboard arcade in the back of his dad's used automobile parts shop. He now has his entire college paid for. There's a foundation, and it's just awesome stuff has happened with Kane. C-A-I-N. You have to check his stuff out. Um, we went to him. We went to all the maker fairs. There were four of them across the country. And then we would just sometimes open up the truck. This is us in, like, downtown New York. And just, like, people would come by. And we would just start to engage them in a conversation about creating their own stuff. Sometimes we'd just go to people's houses and have 3D printer parties. So we just were, like, really open. But the main thing we did is we had hackathons, which are these 48-hour challenges, where the first part of the process, people brainstorm, what would you do? if you knew you couldn't fail? What would you do if you could create anything out of hardware? And then teams would select an idea and then in a day come together and make it. At the first one at Caltech, a team took a work glove off the back of the truck, put in these flex sensors and, and capacitive pads, and they made a glove that was translating American Sign Language into text messages, which was kind of interesting to us. Again, it was like another example after the Berkeley class of stuff that we wouldn't have created, but it should be in the world. And we saw these guys at Texas A&M create a completely mobile um, kind of like lab for eye doctors, because there's parts of the world where you just don't have enough expertise. And so this turned a smartphone into something that could actually diagnose and, and uh, let you know what's happening you know, with your eyes and what you need to do. And we saw dozens of these things. I don't have enough time to go through all of them, but I just, I was m just as inspired on the last day of that six month journey as I was on the first. And we felt like if students using this hacked together, buggy, Velcro covered, you know, HDK can create such awesome things, just imagine what the world would create if given a platform of co-creation. And so we created this, which is a more elegant platform. This is what's called Project Aura. Raise your hand if you've heard of Project Aura before. So, good, yeah. Th those are the early adopters in the room. Keep your hands up. If anyone has any technology problems in their life, talk to those people. Um, it kind of excited the tech world, right? And this was kind of that vision of if a, if a smartphone had unprotected sex with Lego, <laughs> like this would be the love child, right? This is ecosystem of pieces and parts that you get to decide how big your phone is. You get to decide what components are in it. You get to decide how much it costs. And... This really excited the world. And so when we came home, we wanted to continue collaborating with people. So there's a tool out there called D-Scout. It's created by a, a design firm called Gravity Tank. Essentially, it's an app that allows you to do research with people um, using their phone. So they can take pictures 
and videos of what, what are called missions. So you give the mission, like if you're Kellogg, you might say, I want to understand breakfast. What's the best and most frustrating part of that experience? And like within a day, you can get hundreds of snapshots from people's lives of, I hate it, like the milk jug because the milk spills and the ergonomics are weird, or you can get feedback really quickly. And we created, we launched a mission when we announced Project Ara, and this was within 48 hours, the posts around the world that we got back. We had 17,000 contributions from around the world of how people wanted to, they were excited about this. We got everything from, you know, fan art from people to we had, you know, electrical engineers sketching out how to do modular radios, right? I mean, we just, and everything in between. And we started for six months, every month, creating this mission to help our designers and engineers make decisions. Like one of them was we had people prototype their phone, the perfect size, the width and height. And the actual measurement of the three frames of the phone came from 34,000 measurements around the world, which is a fundamental engineering decision that you would never let other people decide for you, typically. And so really we felt like Project Aura was this. this is, these are the profile pictures of all these people that we did this massive global co-creation with um, that we felt make the, the process a lot better. Okay, we're coming into the final stretch. And I want to prove to you or just show, if you're not already convinced of how powerful human-fueled innovation is, we're going to do 60 seconds of making with Play-Doh. So if you don't have Play-Doh, raise your hand. One of your neighbors will give you some. And we're just going to do a minute of sculpting. Now, we're, while we're getting ready, does anyone know what Play-Doh was called before it was Play-Doh? It was called Kutal. Which is pretty awesome because I gave this talk in Amsterdam, and I guess that also means uh, female genitalia. <laughs> and so when I gave this talk, there was you know the audience was like whoa, and I was like I'm awesome. <laughs> um, but in addition to that, kutal also means it was actually wall cleaner. So back when homes were coal heated, soot would settle on the walls, and putty would be used to kind of like get rid of it. Now you can imagine kutal almost went out of business as we switched to gas and electric. And right before they went out of business, one of the executives noticed that a local school teacher had been taking Kutal, bringing it into the classroom, putting in food coloring drops, and using it as modeling clay for art class. And that executive was like, that's the purpose of Play-Doh. That's the purpose of Kutal and created Play-Doh. Right? So again, another example of when you watch how people actually use the stuff that you make, it's another way to get co-creation. So, okay, 60 seconds. Here's your, here's your last challenge of the day. I want you to design the most awesome, amazing, incredible, creative toothbrush from the future. Okay, oral hygiene. You have 60 seconds, create an amazing toothbrush from the future. On your mark, get set. We're about halfway done. It's a lot harder to sculpt than it is to sketch in 60 seconds, but do your best. All right, final stretch, 10 seconds. Okay. All right. Raise your hand if you want to share your toothbrush from the future. All right, JT slash JP. What do you got? So they are these little, I can't hold them, they're little balls, and they would be f like fuzzy and have texture, and you like put them toothpaste on, throw them in your mouth, and you just shake them all around, and it gets rid of the tartar. <laughs>
That's awesome. That's awesome. I could totally get my kids to brush their teeth <laughs> if it was like chewing fuzzy gumballs. That'd be great. Okay, who else wants to share the toothbrush in the future? Yeah. So basically it'd be like a mouth guard and with these little like circular things on the side. And um, you put it in and it'd be like the spinning brush thing inside. That'd clean your teeth. Brilliant. That's brilliant. You know, that's amazing. I heard someone talking about how salty the, t the uh, Play-Doh was. So raise your hand. Be honest. Did you bite? Who bit, who bit into their Play-Doh? Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Raise your hand if you did some mouth guard-like thing, like this gentleman. Yeah. Why do we have to take this one planar surface and bring it to all of these surfaces? Why not just chew a couple of times, right? The technology exists to either 3D print or create that. Awesome. Okay. Who created some other kind of cool thing? Yeah. Um, you can't see it like with the, there's no color difference, but this is your ideal mouth color and type and it's just like a laser that kind of like can clean your teeth that's awesome. that's awesome that's fantastic that's exactly what i want in my mouth is lasers <laughs> that clean my teeth i love that that's great that's great okay let's get someone in the back too i some of you guys are raising your hand i just want to make sure we get someone who wants to share one of their toothbrush from the future anybody yeah all right we'll go here so you put it on and it looks kind of like a smile but it's using ultrasonic frequencies to knock the tartar off your teeth. That's awesome. You guys should get together. I think the laser and ultrasonic <laughs> technology should work together. That's awesome. And then last one over here. Yeah. This is y'all. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, look, I mean, we could spend the next hour cataloging the amazing kind of awesomeness that just happened right now. But look what comes out when you get people to make, right? I gave you no prep other than you, you had no briefing and you only had 60 seconds. And the kind of stuff that starts to emerge when you make and create is fundamentally different than if I had asked you to list on a, on a piece of paper, bullet point out the top 10 ideas of a toothbrush from the future, right? Um, and so, and I just give this example because IDEO actually had this challenge about 20 years ago. Oral-B asked them to design a toothbrush for kids. And they told Oral-B, they said, well, the first part of our process is to observe. And Oral-B kind of freaked out because he said, wait a second, you're going to go into kids' homes at nighttime in the bathroom <laughs> and wash them, brush their teeth? Like, how are you going to do that? Right? And they figured it out, like they, you know, they just observed that one part of the ritual and then kind of exited for the rest. And basically they saw this. Now if you were at IDEO and you were a researcher, what do you think would have stood out to you? It's kind of an important thing that's happening here. It's too big, right? She's got this big kind of adult toothbrush. What else? It's only one plane. She's too happy. This is like some stock photo I grabbed on the internet, so I, just, I don't know if this is actually what they saw, but um, yeah, what they saw was, you know, when we brush our teeth, we have this really superpower ninja skill called manual dexterity. So when we brush our teeth, we use the tips of our fingers, and we use that to get all up in every crevice. You kids don't have that yet, so they do what's called the fat fist. And when they were using these little kind of skinny and long adult toothbrushes, they were kind of flopping about and really awkward. And so they brought that back to IDU and they said, well, a designer uh, you know, took a, a BMX bike handle off a bike and stuck a toothbrush in the middle of it and said, here, this, this is what we should do. And that's kind of what they did, right? This is the squish grip toothbrush, which now if you go to any store and look at toothbrushes for kids, they're all ergonomically designed handles. And I actually was giving this talk at IDEO. And I was, um, I, and there was like one person that was on that team who was older than Fred. And, <laughs> and he was saying, you know, and I asked him, I said, what if we had actually given, what if you had not just observed kids and you knew, use your sociological superpowers to observe that kind of ergonomic grip mismatch? What if you had just given kids to uh, Play-Doh and had them create their own toothbrush from the future. And he readily admitted that 
you would have viscerally seen that insight in front of you because you would have seen fat handled squishy toothbrushes and you probably would have seen fuzzy stuff and lasers and smiles and, and a whole lot more to fuel the process. So we're now getting to the final part of the talk. But if you remember anything, it's put people not just at the center of your process, but invite them to be part of your design team. Have them fuel your process by giving them tools like Play-Doh. Okay, so my two years was up with Regina. I thought I'd work at Google X. I thought I'd work you know, at Apple. The last place in my mind I thought it would ever work is in financial services <laughs> because this is how I view the industry, a bunch of greedy bastards essentially trying to take your money. And, but then I went to a Capital One open house in San Francisco and I saw this design studio. I was like, oh, that's pretty nice. It's kind of better than our Studio Archetype Sapien. Like, it was really nice. They like thoughtfully built in stuff for whiteboards and foam core and everything was on wheels and it was pretty awesome. And then, you know, I'm at Google, I'm trying to understand the opportunity and money and I, I opened up Google search. You know, Google has this cool feature called autocomplete which is kind of awesome because it's data driven, right? This, is com this comes from, there's eight billion queries a day at Google. And what they can do is when you're typing something, they can anticipate the likely things that you're looking at. So I typed in this term. And these are the top results. <laughs> I mean, there's like one positive thing, finances are in the black, right? And then as a designer, to me, this was my tipping point to say, well, if I'm going to have impact in the world, I should probably think about how to heal this deep dysfunction between people and money. So I can't tell you what I'm working on tonight. If you come out with me for drinks later on, or if you talk to Jenny, she'll tell you about what I took out of my wallet earlier today. And what, what, did the, what was the response from the concierge? Oh my God, I love it. Yeah. It's awesome. I'm sorry. I'm teasing you guys. Um, we're just doing early customer beta tests of this project that I'm working on, so I can't really, I'm not going to put it up here for pictures and all that, but I can talk about you guys, with it to you guys, because we're very close to sharing that. Um, but I will tell you a little bit about kind of what my team is doing, and uh, it will be done in like three minutes, and we'll have maybe time for questions. So the other thing is that I learned about Capital One is that their mission is to change banking for good. The way they describe that from our CEO is to bring ingenuity, simplicity, and humanity to banking. And those are three powerful adjectives. And he wasn't thinking about unlocking the power of design in his financial services company, but those three adjectives give lots of vision and permission for the design team to do things. And when I joined Capital One 18 months ago, we were 65 people. I was the first VP of design. We now have Adaptive Path as part of our family. We are 265 folks. There are almost six or seven VPs that are kind of facing off against all of the business units. And we've kind of really grown. And, I, and I've come to believe that Capital One has this as their movie reference uh, instead of the Wolf of Wall Street. And for those millennials that are like scratching their heads like, <laughs> what are you showing? This is a black and white film. <laughs> this is a movie called It's a Wonderful Life. And it's a wonderful, you should watch this movie because it paints a really awesome, it's a, it's a wonderful story and it shows a, how finances and community can come together in powerful ways. Okay, so thing number two. Let me just touch on what I'm doing at Capital One and then we'll wrap it up. Okay, so I actually manage four teams. I call them my, four, my fantastic four. These are uh, what that team kind of looks like. At the end, this is our holiday gathering. We don't like go out for dinner. Like we, ha we actually had an Iron Chef cook-off because we're makers and so this is from that. Um, these four teams, one of them does our wallet app. So this is kind of more of our kind of standard app. This was launched with Apple um, during Apple Pay's launch. And this is actually the first piece of software we've ever created at the bank that's been written up by TechCrunch or the, you know, the tech press. Highest rated financial app in iOS. Um, really, really good experience. I can, there's a lot of detail here uh, that we don't have time to go into. Even like when you make a transaction, it comes as a code, right? Like this. Waldorf thing might be, you know, WA7622. And it takes a lot of work to take that and turn it into something that's understandable by humans and actually give them, well, here's the phone number and here's their website and here to give context. I don't know how if you guys look at your past transactions, but normally it's like, I have no idea what that is. And I'm like, oh, 
That was a gas station, right? So lots of data cleansing and information architecture behind the scenes. The second team is in Chicago. Um, they work on our, what we call our partnerships business. So we have a bunch of clients like Nordstrom and Neiman Marcus and Saks who their loyalty program is actually a Capital One backend. And we private label that so that we have this, ex this chance to learn about these unique client experiences. Uh, the third team is a team that's kind of failed like three or four times, but we're still trying to work on this. The idea of taking all your past financial transactions and giving that to you in service of a better future. So we'll suggest interesting experiences or things that you might want to do based on your financial transactions. The thing is, er, it just even if it's relevant, it just feels like advertising, um, like Groupon. I love Groupon, but when I get those emails, I just delete it right away because I'm like, I don't, I don't know. I just like <laughs> only when the Krispy Kreme thing comes out because that's awesome. <laughs> okay, but that team is still working on stuff. Now the fourth team is what I call the Design Pirates, barring Regina's language, and you know the Sharpie marker, and light bulb. Jolly Roger, you know, like crossbones, that's like awesome. And we're basically following the DARPA model. And I, we, we don't have time to go into it here, but essentially it's these three elements. It's about ambitious goals. And the way that Regina talks about this is you don't want to be in the zone of impossible. Like, I want to work on teleporting human beings. Awesome. Like, that's great. But it's kind of impossible right now. And I don't want to be on the inevitable side, right? Like, oh, I just want to add this one feature to my website or app. Which, where you want to be is in the middle, which we call improbable. You take things that are currently maybe believed to be impossible, but do the hard design and engineering work to demonstrate that. The response you want is that we might be able to do that. And if you ask that question, there's incredible force to go from the improbable to the inevitable. So number one is working in that inevitable space. The second one is time bound, right? So at DARPA, they kick you out. At Capital One, I said we're shipping essentially within a year of forming an idea. And the third one is you have to give your teams independence to choose what they will do. You can't have constraints in all of those, right? Constrain time, but open up possibility. There's a great article about this for those that want to geek out on like innovation process, Harvard Business Review. This is called the Special Forces Model of Innovation that Dr. Dugan wrote um, a couple years ago to articulate this process, so you can check it out. But, um, but this is the last thing. This is fast. I thought I knew fast. This is a new level of fast. This is like kick out of the organization fast. Um, and that, that constraint really changes things. Now, when I was building my team, we wanted to do the HBT model. I think back in the day, I think, Hugh, you and I talked this about the butt model, right? Business, users, technology. You want to work in the middle. But, um, you know, Silicon Valley always starts with the T, you know, some shiny object like wearables or cloud computing or whatever it is, and like are in search of a design. Um, Capital One o often starts with business framing, you know, like let's improve our sign up drop-off ratios by 5%. <laughs> that will generate $2.2 .2 million, whatever it is. And then, you know, no one starts with the H. You know, we're always struggling to advocate for people at the end. So what I wanted to do was start with the H. So I hired, the first person I brought on was a PhD social anthropologist, um, Akiko Tanaguchi. She worked at IDEO and Xerox Park. This is her on the left over here. Um, this guy was just crossing the street and I couldn't get him out <laughs> of the picture. This guy is a biomedical engineer and a, a kind of a business analyst who had Capital One experience, so he was helping us with financial stuff. This is me, and I wore the same outfit today because I wanted your world to be like synchronous. <laughs> and then this is the company's first industrial designer. He's the guy that designed the Moto X for Motorola. This is a medical illustrator. She was actually my admin, but half of her time she was a sketch noter. So do you guys do sketch noting ever at AIGA or events? It's a super cool discipline where people in real time visualize conceptually what's happening. So she does that for the team all the time, which is really powerful. And then this guy is a creative director from Apple and from Samsung who is doing software. And what I'm going to do is just actually show you a little bit of our intro video, and then we'll wrap it up. Um, now, I did hire this guy. Uh, this is Jonathan Castro, who <laughs> is a filmmaker. And half of his time, he hangs out with us and kind of captures what's going on. And every week he, he releases like a one minute 
episodic thing to the entire company at Capital One. Because, not because we want to celebrate ourselves, but because we want to elicit reaction and feedback and critique because we're in San Francisco and most of the organization is, well, two in Colorado and then 47,000 on the East Coast. And so he's creating this documentary called Improbable Bankers because we're working at Improbable Zone. And it's also very improbable that any of us would be bankers. And so this is like, this is like a little intro piece. And we'll wrap it up. My name is Austin Anderson, and my superpower is being able to visualize what other people can't. I'm Makiko. I am an anthropologist, able to understand and read you know, people's needs and life and desires and their goals and, yes, understand people. I'm Dan, and my superpower is I can see things that should be that don't exist yet. My name is Jason. My superpower is bringing ideas to life in experiences that solve people's problems. My name is Matt. My superpower is finding stories within data. My name's Carl, and my superpower is taking bits and turning them into atoms. I gotta be honest, I never ever thought I'd work within banking. But a designer solves problems for people. And when I looked at the relationship that we have with money, how confusing it is and how dysfunctional it is, I felt that this would be an amazing place to heal that relationship. It was very important for me to actually be immersed in their living context so that I can understand you know, what they are doing or the choices they are making and really the meaning of it and why they do certain things in a particular way, right? In order to empower people, we need to shift this whole discourse around banking and that became a really important inspiration for us to think about our opportunity area. Our minds and hearts were just brimming with ideas. We used a method called paper storming, where in 15 minutes the team generated over 100 ideas about how we can improve people's lives. And then we took the four or five best ideas and imagined how those could be real so I'm going to save money for my son's education. There's a picture of my son and the, there is a story. Hello, Makiko. Reminder. The bills that are due this week are water and cell phones. So when I'm sort of looking at Target, I'm kind of conscious about how much I have to spend. But, you know, temptation is great. Check it out. This is my card. Oh, I totally cool. customize it just to me. I just love this little recycled red orb. And sometimes I just kind of put it you know, on my watch or like, you know, I just, you know, sometimes just like a little worry stone. I got this app that uh, shows me kind of what's going on. When you, when you look at what Dan's doing, I think it's going a step further. It's bringing skills and backgrounds that just haven't been applied in banking before. And I, and I love what we've done in the sense that we've said, Dan, do your thing. We're not going to tell you how to do it. Uh, we want to see how you approach it. We're letting him do his thing, and, and we're watching and thoughtfully learning from the results and the, and the way he's applying himself to it. And so really understanding the pain that our customers feel and the challenges they face and, and bringing fresh, innovative ways to tackle those problems. I just feel like what our team is doing, it goes far beyond the confines of this small group of people. I mean, our story is really one about Capital One finding its potential through inspired design and through understanding the lives of people. So I'm most excited about being part of this larger group of 40,000 plus associates who are trying to do the right thing in an industry that nobody really trusts, and nobody really understands. And that's pretty exciting. All right, I think the big insight there is that slow motion looks every, makes everything look more awesome. That little shot of us walking across the street, like I told the filmmaker, I was like, I want it to look like Brooklyn Nine-Nine. I don't know if you guys watched that, but like there's that shot. It's like awesome. Okay. Well, listen, that's it. Um, I hope you guys had a little insight. Um, if you remember, the three things are really about getting more fearless, re removing your fear of the judgment of your peers, helping ordinary people to do that through human-fueled co-creation. And the last one is moving really, really fast. Um, if you want to reach out to me, um, Twitter, that's a zero. And uh, just reach out to me anytime. As Jenny knows, I will respond to every single person in whatever way you want. Well, not any way you want. Um, 
Listen, it's kind of late. Um, it is 8.29. I'm going to leave it to Jenny and team's best judgment, whether we want to take a couple of questions or not, or whether we just want to, like, chill. We have the space for another hour, but what do you think? A couple questions? Okay. The developers of web programming and more on like the coding technological side involved with the innovators and like the designers to like really make sure there's collaboration between like the developers and the designers. No, that's a great question. Um, I mean, really, I would say there's no, there should be no clear handoff if you're doing it well. Like developers should be involved as early as they are interested. And I think any discipline should be involved in some of the upfront work of exploring and brainstorming what's happening. Um, and I think, you know, that we, in, in our days, we were actually at Sapient, we were making this transition from kind of more standard waterfall software development where, you know, you'd have some strategists and researchers do their thing and then you'd have this whole interaction kind of phase and there'd be a design phase and then you'd like develop stuff. And we know that that doesn't work very well, right? Because you don't learn very fast. And by the time you put all this energy into building something at the end, you're like, wait, that doesn't work, right? And you need to test that. So agile development in software is a really nice process that helps to kind of mash everyone together. It often squishes out design vision. So with agile, the key thing is to have some separate sprints where the designers can bring along whoever's interested in a more exploratory process. Um, but I would say the goal is to, with all of this, is to fail early. And you can't fail unless developers are part of that conversation. So as early as possible. Oh. Not doing a good, very, very good mic job over there. Hi. Yeah. Whoa. Loud. Hi. <laughs> I'm curious what the number one issue or problem people said they had with their relationship with money. You know, there's a lot of things uh, that were going on that, but I think the most important thing was, um, you know, it's well, first of all, let me just say that when I first went to Capital One, I said, well, I'm going to do whatever I want. Like, that was part of the deal. That's why I went there. It was like the what would you do if you knew you couldn't fail. But I said, but what would you want me to do? And they said, why don't you work on mobile payments? Because that's what everyone else is working on. You go to angel.co, angellist.co, where all the startups of the world are listed. You type in mobile payments, and there's 692 startups working in the space. And when we went to people's lives, no one was asking for, I want more Bitcoin in my life. <laughs> or I want, like, less friction. Or I want things to be more digital. Right? What we found is that people could barely talk about money in a healthy way. Like, there is no public education around finances. We probably didn't have money modeled very well to us growing up because our parents didn't necessarily know what to do with money. And the primary emotions that people felt was guilt, shame, fear, confusion, and anxiety. Not, not always really deeply, but at, that was the undercurrent of the conversation. It was like talking to people about weight loss or things like that. And, and so, I mean, and there is a lot of challenge of poverty Right, this whole conversation around the 99% and like there's a lot of families that just even though they want to do the right thing and they might have like a PhD degree in finances, they're still unable to have healthy finances because the physics of their income just aren't working. But put that aside for a minute. We found that the most important thing that we could do is inspire healthy behavioral change in many of the same ways that you would think about physical fitness because, you know, we know how to be fit. It's a very simple formula, you know. Calories in should be less than calories out. And if you want to build muscle, you should do that. Like, I mean, it's very simple. The hard thing is not the action. The hard thing is engaging. Like, because if I'm really overweight, I don't want to go to a gym and all these sexy people are around me, right? Like, that's the horrible thing to do, right? Fitbit was great because it started to, like, say, hey, you did 6,000 steps today. Doing what you already do, just do 4,000 more, right? And got us a little bit more active. So I feel like that's, I, I didn't answer your question exactly, but I, it's a bigger problem. 
than like one issue of in money. It's it's the it's having the conversation. Dan, <clears throat> that, Dan, thank you so much. Uh, that was you're you're awesome, very inspiring. Uh, what and your glasses are fantastic. Um, <clears throat> this is a good symbol of design. These are traditional <clears throat> frames with a simple color. It just happens to not be as expected. It's kind of like Fred's beret. Is kind of like the same thing. But it matches your. It, normally, it's red, but it's black. Yeah. Um, Sorry, Fred. I'm just picking on you tonight. I don't know. Why. Yeah. Uh, what I would like to know is, do you have any go-to sources uh, that you, you know, sort of consistently read or um, research for to kind of help glean some of this knowledge that you gain, or is it all just through your past experiences and you keep building on it? Yeah, I actually have a lazy eye. And when I read, my eyes get really tired, and like I hate reading. <laughs> um, so, and I'm not an academic. I mean, you could see from the nature of my conversation, I wasn't exactly sure how long this would be. I wasn't, you know, I like put three bullets in there just to make it feel like official, but you know, really, I just told a story. Um, my way of learning is just by experiencing and doing and just engaging. I do think um, I found myself more inspired by folks in the maker movement. Um, and so I don't know if there's a tech shop out here or another, like a, like a hacker space or a maker space, but seeing how young and old and community folks are coming together to create all kinds of things um, has been probably the most inspiring thing. Maker Fair has probably been the most amazing thing than any book that I've read. But, I, but Creative Confidence, I think, is the best starting place to get to the physics of what's required to have this kind of innovation. I really have to pee because I've been hydrating because I'm at a high altitude. So maybe two more questions will be good. So I'm running my first design sprint on Monday. Awesome. What, what advice can you give me? Awesome. I, I, well, I think involve the people who are participating um, in a way that leaves a little bit more kind of open space. Like the classic... Well, a design sprint tends to be a sprint that's more exploratory. And so I think what's kind of important there is you need to frame things. You can't just say, all right, guys, we're talking about the future of the company. For the next hour, I want you to team up and just sketch. Like people are like, what are you talking about? Like, I, you know, like with, even with this Play-Doh activity, I was like toothbrush for the future, right? So the, for a design sprint, I think the most important thing is to give enough framing that there's something to, for people to focus on, but enough openness that you don't artificially constrain the problem space. And actually, if I had framed that toothbrush thing better, I wouldn't have said toothbrush. I would have said oral hygiene from the future. Many of you just said screw the toothbrush anyway. But so I think that's one thing. I think the second thing is you know, really involve the team in kind of the planning and the feedback about it. Because if it's the first one that you're doing, you can just be honest and say, I have never done this before but I'm really excited to do it. So I just want feedback along the way. I might cry because I'm sensitive right now that I've never done it before, but you know, just like be honest with people and invite that feedback. Um, and people will feel, I think, more engaged. And then I, I think the last thing I would say is your work is only as good as the story that you can tell about it because there's, communication is critical. If you can't tell a story and communicate to folks and give them insights, all your work will be wasted. You might have come up with the most radical, amazing thing that will transform your software, your business. So think about from at the beginning about how you will tell the story in what kind of format or medium and have people create artifacts that allow you to tell a story that, that people can hear. All right, last question. Hi, Dan. Thanks for coming out. <laughs> oh, here. Hey. Uh, following up on your experience, um, how did you craft like a career where you happen to be at Google and all this awesome mm. place? Was there a strategic strategy behind that, or just like accident? Now, if you reference my other answer, <laughs> you'd, you'd, you'd know that. Um, so, well, let me see. Microsoft was a conscious choice to go to one at the time, one of the biggest technology companies. But it was actually kind of I needed some courage because folks like David Shell and you know these awesome designers here were like, you know, you don't work for Microsoft. Um, 
so I think what I, what I really cared about was I wanted to solve interesting problems. And I found myself gravitating to environments where my, skill, where my skills were desperately needed. Right? Like Capital One, I'm not saying they're broken, but they're, they're in desperate need of thoughtful design, right? Because the, the, the space is so important. Um, I've never cared about compensation, title, those kind of things. Um, except now I live in Palo Alto and rent's ridiculous. And so I'm a little bit thinking about that a little bit more. But I've always gravitated to, like, I was leading a 35 person global design research team at Motorola when Regina shows up. And on that day, she, we meet and she, we, we were hitting it off. And she's like, Dan, I'm going to ask you right now. You have to decide. Will you leave your entire team behind and work for me? And I'm going to kick you out in two years. And I just, I was, I, I was like, absolutely. Like, no hesitation. You know, partly because I built a team. There were, there were leaders that could take over the team. But, so I think go on your gut and on what you're really passionate about. Because, like, I'm a pioneer. Like, there are those of us who are settlers who like to just root and structure and kind of methodical growth. Like, I can't do that. If, you, if that's how you work, just be true to what you're really passionate The way I tell my kids about this is um, you take three overlapping circles. One is what you love to do. The second one is what you're really good at. And the third one is where you can have a lot of impact in the world. Work at the intersection of those. And it doesn't matter if it's Google or Microsoft or a foundation with Malala. Like, it, whatever you're going to do, it's going to be awesome. That's all the time my bladder has <laughs> available. Thank you, guys. I appreciate you spending some time. We're going to be hanging out for a little while. And there's like a little bit of a dinner thing with maybe we don't want to expand that to everybody. But after that, there's going to be an after party maybe. And then I'm meeting some people at 7 a.m. So I may not go to bed. So just follow me on Twitter. I'll post where we're at. You guys have been awesome. Thank you.